so we'll allow folks to enter, give an awkward staring at the screen time. Hi folks. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm actually feeling quite a lot better already just from the fun of talking to you both. <laughs> Good. We'll get started in another minute. Okay. Jeff, I hope you have some tea or whiskey. I have some uh, water. Okay, well, that's good too, I suppose. <laughs> All right, let's do this thing. Good All evening. Right. And welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event virtually this evening with Jeff Dyer presenting his new book, The Last Days of Roger Federer. He will be talking with Sam Lipsight. Is that right, Sam? Sorry. All right. Thank you, thumbs up. Yeah. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thank you to Jeff and Sam and the team at FSG for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We were gonna be in person, but this, this, this is uh, the way things are going these days. So we're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. So thank you, all of you. A couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though. And there are a couple of different ways you can interact with each other and with our panelists this evening, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for our panelists and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question that you'd like to have answered, please post that question in the Q&A module. <laughs> Yes, a very official module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We will be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. If you've never used the Q&A module, don't worry. We'll figure it out together. <laughs> And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Last Days of Roger Federer, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Jeff's book and many others on site, including Sam's. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S., and there will be a buy link in the chat as thanks for attending tonight's virtual event. We are offering 10% off the featured book and your coupon code Greenlight Events 10, all caps, into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. Uh, so Jeff was going to stop by to sign since he was gonna be in person. So I don't I don't know about a signed copy, but uh yeah, that, that, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> we can launch the sign module. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll um, sign it in person uh, on on Zoom. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. you're here tonight, so you get to see get to have the whole home experience. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, support the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of bookstores, and please buy tonight's featured book. So it's a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Sam Lipsight, the author of the story collections Venus Drive and the Fun Parts and four novels, Hark, The Ask, a New York Times notable book, The Subject, Steve and Homeland, which was a New York Times notable book and received the Believer Book Award. His fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and Best American Short Stories, among other places. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, no big deal. He lives in New York City and teaches at Columbia University, where we're getting a little, a little uh, preview into the, the offices of Columbia for a little behind the scenes action. <laughs> Sam will be speaking with our featured author, Jeff Dyer. Jeff is the award-winning author of many books, including Out of Sheer Rage, Yoga for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Do It. That's such a great title. 
<laughs> Zona, is that how you pronounce that? Zona? Yep. Great. Seesaw and the essay collection, otherwise known as the human condition. Another great title. Winner of a National Book Critics Circle Award for criticism. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a member of the Academy, American Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dyer lives in Los Angeles, where he is writer in residence at the University of Southern California. His books have been translated into 24 languages, 24. His new book, The Last Days of Roger Federer, is an extended meditation on late style and last works, blending criticism, memoir, and humorous banter of the most serious kind. Jeff sets his own encounter with late middle age against the last days and last works of writers, painters, footballers, musicians, and tennis stars who mattered to him throughout his life. Revisiting Nietzsche's breakdown in Turin, Beethoven's final quartets, and John Coltrane's cosmic melodies and many more. Jeff is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Sam and with all of you. So without further ado, please take it away, Jeff and Sam. Well, great. Thank you, Kay. Wow, I got a distinct sense of having been upstaged by the introduction, don't you, Sam? That was so great. Yes, I don't think we'll be able to match that, but... It really won't. Yeah, well, sorry uh, to everyone that I um, can't be there. I've actually uh, got COVID, but uh, really, I just started feeling better in the just the little time that we were doing the warm-up. So uh, this has had a clearly... Um, uh, green light has a, a massively sort of therapeutic effect. Um, so yeah, as Kay mentioned, there's, uh, there's stuff about Nietzsche in this book. So I'll just read a, um, I'll just read a section from quite near the beginning and I'll read a couple of sections because they're so short, including a section that is actually a kind of key to the whole structure of the book, kind of Rosetta Stone. So here we go. Many commentators, especially academics, have found Nietzsche's idea of the eternal recurrence puzzling. Alain Kundera points out that other philosophers have also been perplexed by a mad myth that he himself finds mysterious. Lacking the necessary training in philosophy, I took to it like a duck, duck to water. Paradoxically, the eternal recurrence of all things insists that we have only one life. It's a formulation that offers no alternative to our being saddled with and sealed completely within this life. Not only is there no afterlife, but crucially, there is no escape in death, no way of downgrading what happens by claiming that however terrible life might be, it will at some point be over and done with. It's unprovable and yet from time to time, Always at an unexpected moment, we get an elusive sense that we have lived our life before and, according to Nietzsche, will do so again and again. That was the, one of the first things that struck me about Nietzsche, the way the eternal recurrence offered an explanation of the sensation of deja vu, the flicker that is both prem premonition and memory. The strangest aspect of deja vu is the way that the sensation always extends itself slightly beyond the moment when we've registered it as such, so, so that it includes our saying, I've just had a deja vu, and we're briefly locked into the loop of the moment, just as we're locked into the endless loops of life. The film Groundhog Day flirts with the premise of the eternal recurrence, but permits a slight improvement or learning over time with each repetition. The best filmic representation of the idea though is Christian Mark lays the clock, exactly the same 24 hour film forever with multiple climaxes along the way, but no finale on the hour at noon or even at the end of the day at midnight and no pause. Moments after midnight, the same day, the same endless loop of 86,400 seconds is already <coughs> rolling around. <coughs> oh, my word. <coughs> I'll do that again. 
moments after midnight, the same day, the same endless loop of 86,400 seconds is already rolling around again. Um, I'll read from the very next bit. Um, as many of you will know, Nietzsche spent his last sane uh, uh, months in Turin uh, and then uh, went uh, famously had this breakdown when he saw a taxi driver whipping his horse and then Nietzsche apparently uh, threw his arms around the, uh, the suffering horse. And anyway, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, we pick up the story with me being in Turin. Turin is one of those cities that for various reasons, I'm always returning to. The first time I was there in the early 1990s, I headed as soon as possible to Piazza Carlo Alberto where Nietzsche had lived. A plaque on the wall explained in my rough translation that in this house, Federico Nietzsche knew the fullness of spirit that challenges the unknown, the will to power that drives the hero. Here, as attests his high destiny and genius, he wrote Ecce Homo, the book of his life, in memory of the creative hours, spring, autumn, 1888, at the centennial of his birth, the city of Turin placed this memorial, 15 October, 1944. So although it was erected after the fall of Mussolini, who, unlike Hitler, had in his youth been a connoisseur and admirer of Nietzsche, this memorial honored him in terms associated with fascism. Still, at least there was a memorial, and each time I returned to the city, I passed by it, sometimes accidentally. In 2013, I was in Turin for a jazz festival and found that I was strolling through a familiar square rendered briefly unfamiliar by extensive renovation. Blue corrugated fencing had cordoned off a section of the building at the corner of what I realized was Piazzo Carlo Alberto. In a sods law way, I thought that the plaque would be behind this cordon thereby denying the pilgrim the confirmation he craves. And then I saw it on the corner of the street where I'd entered the square. The upheal upheaval of building work made it more obvious than ever that a new memorial was needed to free Nietzsche from the wartime quasi-fascistic bombast of the hero and the will to power. Instead, there should be a sculptor of the moment sculpture of the moment when he threw his arms around the poor horse being beaten by its driver. It wouldn't have to be a realist sculpture, but that episode would be the tight defining part of the commission. Standing there, I conceived the idea of a competition inviting sculptures, sculptors to come up with ideas for exactly such an artwork. I was already thinking like an influential member of the Turin City Council, but almost instant, instantly, <coughs> I saw that it would be better if one were mayor of Turin, or ideally a dictator with untrammeled powers so as to cut down on the preliminary bureaucratic rigmarole that attends a major undertaking such as this. <coughs> Perhaps this is where the urge to power starts to make itself felt. <coughs> the belief that you are right, that it's so obviously the best thing to do, <coughs> to erect a statue of Nietzsche in a public square, that the opinions of others are no more than a hindrance to be trampled down and clambered over as quickly and ruthlessly as possible. And it so clearly was a good idea, since in the middle of the square, there's already an equine statue, some generalissimo on a horse, on a plinth, sword raised, going nowhere, but in the way of these statues, going nevertheless. He's facing the National Museum, wearing one of those old fashioned, whatever they're called, hats. Turin, like most major cities in Europe, is full of this stuff. Putting up third rate statues like this is part of the project, part of the project and one of the rewards of achieving nationhood. But this rote bit of statuary would be revived and improved when offset by the Nietzsche statue, which this was emerging as another part of the brief would be A, at ground level rather than on a pedestal, 
B, life-size, C, tucked discreetly into accordance, in a co in, into a corner, in accordance with the way that Nietzsche created his earth-changing work while living in almost complete obscurity. This was a marvelous idea and one to which the council would be sympathetic because although the square was dominated by this old statue, part of it was given over to a temporary exhibition of ecological po po posters for public transport and cycling. The new Nietzsche monument, which would be anything but monumental, would be in keeping with this mood, signaling the transition from conquest of nature as represented by the military man astride his horse to reconciliation with it as the philosopher threw his arms around the horse's neck. It would also embody the transition in Nietzsche's reputation from hero and promulgator of the Superman to man of compassion and proto horse whisperer, even if there's no sign in his writing that he gave a rat's ass about ill-treated animals. The irony is that although the whooped horsey must have welcomed Nietzsche's intervention, really it was poor Nietzsche who was in need of help, of compassion and love. Maybe, I thought, as if I were now not just organizing and judging the competition, but in the way of dictators submitting my own proposal for what would turn out to be the winning entry by a unanimous decision, it would be possible to create a statue in which horse and man held each other in a mutually consoling embrace. I walked on, simultaneously animated by this project of public works and eco-urban renewal and disinclined, disinclined to do anything further about it, except imagining the grand opening ceremony and unveiling to be followed by a screening later that same night of Bella Tarr's last film, The Turin Horse, which I'd never had the patience to sit through. Thank you all. Sorry about that, uh, about all, all that coughing. I think the coughing even added to it, but I love that passage, Jeff. Um, I love this book. Speaking of eternal recurrence, I think this is maybe the third or fourth time I've interviewed you about one of your books. Um, and I'm very excited to do this tonight. Um, when you mentioned Rosetta, uh, a Rosetta Stone, I see what you mean for, for the way uh, one can sort of decode what you're doing in the rest of the book. I also found a paragraph that I, that towards the very end of the book that I thought beautifully described what you were doing. And I, I, what I especially admired is you didn't put this in the front to tell us what you were doing, but you sort of kind of describe as, as you're leaving on your way out of the book. And it's, uh, it's late in the book, but you say uh, Adorno's late style in Beethoven was an important early reference point for this book about last things, some of which are late, while some are precociously early. Not that, this ever, not that this was ever intended to be a comprehensive study of last things or of lastness generally. It's about a congeries of experiences, things, and cultural artifacts that, for various reasons, have come to group themselves around me in a rough constellation during a phase of my life. Though not my last, hopefully, this phase is marked by a daily increasing consciousness that the next may well be, so much so that I feel I'd better get this done now in case it comes around sooner than I think, or that the last phase, whenever it comes, might be distinguished by an inability on my part to identify or articulate it. And I thought that was a sort of lovely summation of this wonderful book that I had just read that I hope everyone will read. Um, but I also, it made me think of some, an earlier uh, moment in the book where you're talking about interviewing uh, John Berger on stage and you asked him how he could have written so many books. And his answer was, and I've heard this from other writers too, but his answer was, well, I, I think every book is my last book. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've thought about over your career? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. And but by the way, Sam, to go back to your initial point, I'm, I'm so glad that you sort of reminded me of that of that passage, which is indeed a sort of key sort of explanation. And yeah, you're absolutely right that um, uh, it yeah it comes rather discreetly, very nearly at the end. And uh, there's there's of course no introduction to this book. We just we just plunge straight in. 
And I like the idea that the reader is maybe sort of unsure uh, for quite a while of what kind of book it is they're, they're reading, you know, what, what's it about? How is it progressing? You know, why, why is this section one moment about Gillian Welch, say, and the next, next word going on about Nietzsche? And then, you know, anyway, so I, I, yeah, that's, uh, I like the idea that uh, the reader has to sort of navigate their way through it sort of on, on their own rather than being signposted uh, by me. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the great pleasures of the book. And also you begin to, the reader begins to recognize the patterns and the associations yeah. and the linkages. And uh, that's an exciting part of the experience. Yes, it, it, exactly that. And yes, yeah. Um, and yeah, and then you sort of, uh, and I think then, I mean, as a reader, hopefully you can then have that, that nice feeling of sitting back in your chair, relaxing, feeling, oh yeah, I mean, uh, there is, there is some kind of order here. It's not just kind of some kind of bucket into which he's just randomly sort of uh, 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 put, put these things. But yeah, there is a, uh, a pattern, as you say, a structure or an, or an ordering uh, at work. I mean, very much so. You remember that bit when, um, uh, you know, that I read from the, about the Christian Markley uh, film about there being uh, 86 thousand four hundred uh, seconds in the day well then uh, you know it turns out that's very important because uh, you know on page 266 I then say um, uh, blah, blah, blah. as I said on the first part of this book among the first of its 86,400 words so it turns out oh, yeah. there, are, there are as many words in the, 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 the book were you, as there are. were you shaving or to, to get to the right <laughs> oh, I was uh, I was shaving, adding, <laughs> subtracting, and then when I changed it, it, became a hellish task for everybody involved. When we got to the proof, you know, at the the last proofreading stage, when we spotted a mistake, that meant we then had to, you know, add. Anyway, it became well. Uh, if you cut a word, you have to add a word to. to yeah, yeah. yeah so anyway, get, but that's, get number. But yeah. I love that. I love the. I mean, some of my favorite books have a certain kind of structure, you know, imposed upon them like that. That I think can be really fun. Did, did you find that pressure interesting? Well, it wasn't uh, imposed on it. It was arrived at. And right. then after it was arrived at as a, as a possibility, then I had to, um, um, uh, you know, conform to it. If it had been uh, completely, I mean, the book was pretty much complete at about 95,000 words. So that was, it was, it was doable like, like that. And, um, yeah, anyway, so that was, uh, that's what was going on there. But to go back to the second part of your point about, uh, that great John Berger, uh, um, comment. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've been feeling that I've been finished as a writer for almost my entire career as I joke at one point in the book you know that's what's definitely kept kept me going um, but um, uh, this and I mean I've always hoped I've always wanted to live the life of the career writer you know the, um, the writer who uh, finishes a book on the Friday and maybe has the weekend off and parties a bit and then you know or maybe even a month off and then gets gets going with a new one but I've always found that completely impossible I've always collapsed into a complete kind of indolence after a book and have um, uh, uh, and that's I would say the the greatest discipline for me of my writing life has been coming to terms with that of not of trying to resist falling into terrible uh, despair and depression during that phase, but recognizing it as just a necessary uh, part of the process. But God, I'm so envious of Larry McMurtry, you know, who finished Moving On, which was a very long book, and then just felt so, as you are at the end, when you're, when you're going so well, he had so much energy, he just went straight on with, without a pause and wrote, uh, All My Friends Are Gonna Be Strangers, which is actually a terrific book. That's, yeah, I, I envy that as well. I, I, I'm thinking of an essay I always liked by Gilbert Sorrentino about, I can't remember the title now, but he talks about that feeling of being bereft when you finish something, that depression you're talking about, 
but it's that it's a feeling of loss too because you when you're working on something you know you're alive and yeah. and now you're not anymore until the next thing is going and that can be very difficult i've always found that very difficult yes and you know people i mean uh, people do in all walks of life and for you know uh, for athletes it comes to them very hard because uh, you know um okay you know with a when you're after six months of not doing much as a writer you get back on the horse again and when athletes retire they might find retirement so intolerable that they'll come back for another year or whatever but at some time at some point they're not going to get uh, back on the horse and people adjust to that um, uh, life after the thing that has defined them in uh, with various degrees of success or failure don't they they do and you know that brings us to the the title of the book obviously um and uh but i also it also made me think about you write about so many different people and and different art forms and sports but i i started to uh think of two categories the categories of stuff jeff loves and also does and the stuff that jeff loves but doesn't do so oh, you yeah. you love tennis and you play tennis you love literature and you write literature but music you're not a musician but you love music and um and you you love you're not a filmmaker but you love film and so I, I, it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition as i was going but and maybe we can revisit that because i know that a lot of the book has to do not only with roger federer and tennis and the idea of the athlete and the end to, you know the ending the late style of an athlete and the the uh the end time of an athlete's uh span but also your own travails as an athlete, <laughs> as, a, as an well, avid tennis player, player as a as a as a as a as a man who's been lifted up by knee supports of late, <laughs> but uh, to a new level, I think, or a renewed level. But uh, has your relationship to your body? How did that sort of uh, influence this book? Yeah, I guess it was. Um, um, it was. I mean, the, I really noticed that major creeps starting to to appear from uh, the time i was 60 and actually for those of you who not had enough of me droning on about my aches and pains and i think I, I say at one point in the book it really was quite an effort of will to stop the book becoming a a kind of uh, an injury journal or a, or a sprain diary you know i've actually uh, there's a, a I, uh, there's a there's a follow-up that I'm publishing in the New Statesman about the elbow surgery I had after the proofs were completed. So if you feel your life lack, lacks all meaning after reading the last uh, page of this book, well, there's a, there's an update uh, coming soon. But yeah, I was, uh, I mean, perhaps that sense of some sort of uh, physical uh, diminishment, that was part of a larger notion, which is this, Thing of things that happen to you gradually. So, you know, we, I, it's something I'm really conscious of in books that I, so, so often book, the books are sort of advertised as, uh, you know, about a day that will change the character's lives forever or an encounter or something. And that's okay. That, of course, that has great appeal as a dramatic advice. But I, I felt I was interested in almost the exact opposite, this idea, not of the suddenly, but the things that happen gradually. And, you know, that's so difficult to keep track of. <coughs> but I um, mean, um, it's something that I felt was worth addressing. So I was trying to, um, yeah, just trying to talk about the ways that things have gradually changed. And of course, so there's this thing that you, um, you know, you feel more tired after, after playing tennis than you did 10 years ago or whatever, stuff like this. You know, you can't um, you can't drink as much as you used to. All of this, it's all the kind of stuff that we all talk about when we get together. We people of a of a of a um, a certain a certain age. But then also, I was quite interested in this notion of um, you know the way that um, uh, uh, works that evolve very very gradually. So I, there's a section about William Bazinski's disintegration loops and all of this so very often there's a kind of um, there's a kind of um, sort of linking between the theme and the form my own corporeal concerns 
and some sort of and sort of larger cultural manifestation of it. And so, you know, for example, the classic, you know, the supreme uh, example really of debility um, uh, being a factor in somebody's uh, creating their, their sort of last works. Well, it, it's Beethoven and the, the late quartets and, and piano sonatas, I guess. Beethoven uh, coping with his, uh, you know, with, with his almost complete deafness. Right. Um, and there's also, you mentioned, uh, well, also you did write briefly and you've written before about a minor stroke you had. And that, yeah. I also thought of that as sort of, along with the slow debilitation, there are these moments too that also are striking reminders of, you know, our frailty. Yeah, do you know, that's interesting, Sam, the stroke thing, which I'd almost forgotten about it. And I think it's very significant that I did stroke, uh, so I did forget about it because that was really sudden and incredibly dramatic. And for a little while afterwards, I was conscious of the way that you could be walking along the street and then suddenly the ground would open up in front of you. And you could, as in the case of Keith Jarrett, who I write about in the book, you could be, uh, you know, you, that would be the end of your performing life, or, you know. Uh, and then, you know, so for, there was a little phase as I, in the aftermath of that stroke, which I recovered from very, very quickly. Um, uh, when I was really psychologically aware of that, and you know, and then you know, and for a little while I lived that life of treating each day as a gift, and then that faded, and each day, each day then just became a sort of usual mixture of part gift, part irritation, and part boredom. And um, in no time at all, I was just back to uh, you know, it really didn't have a much of an impact on me. I think the 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 thing that does tend to have more of an impact on on one is uh, is what it, it, my parents died and after that I had a much greater sense of of um, of, of more mortality I think I think we I should also say that in addition to uh, uh, someone like this is linking up with that point someone like Beethoven who suffered that you know de that debility which was a key part of what he went on to do. Um, this is a book about last, not late things. So there's examples in the book of people, I guess Coltrane is one of them, you know, whose last works came in what should have been the middle of his life. You know, uh, it just sort of happened that he got ill rather suddenly. So what we, the last works that Coltrane recorded, they seem to me to be transitional works and we're not sure where he would have transi transitioned to had he not been so un, uh, unfortunate enough to, to have died so, so suddenly you know, and, and so young. And then equally, we can think of people who don't even do their last works when they're middle-aged. You know, there's plenty of, plenty of those NYRB classic books are by writers who only published one book. So their, their first book was their last book. Yeah, and well, I think, the, I think your book goes back and forth often between the late and the last. And in a fascinating yeah. way. And, you know, Coltrane is a good example of the last, there's a great line with somebody saying, you know, Turner never painted his last painting and you wonder what could that possibly mean? Um, uh, which, and that was, that was really interesting. Also, yes, the idea of people who, who published one book or, you know, at, and I agreed with you on this and this was controversial, I think, but you said, uh, you know, James Salter's The Hunters was his, his best book and his, it was his first book. And so, you know, there may be people who write, you know, one book and then write many other books, but, you know, in some ways their last work really was their first book. Um, so that's an interesting, interesting juxtaposition, the late and the last and the first. And, and then the, the, the stray one that sort of stuck in my mind was de Kooning in that little window when he was, you know, demented, on the edge of dementia and doing these kind of brilliant paintings, but having to be sort of directed. Oh yeah, I um, mean uh, yes. I mean, really, <clears throat> I think actually not just on the edge of dementia. I think in the in the in the depths oh, of it, but, right? Uh, they're just sort oh, of wheeled up to a canvas, and then uh, you know, but yeah, that's an, that's the most sort of extreme example I can I can think of. Yeah. So um, the book talks of you know I'd say the major figures in the book are are Dylan and Nietzsche and uh, Lawrence makes a return. And and Federer, uh, well, and and then, but the book begins interestingly enough with with Kerouac, 
Yeah. And there's a there's a picture of Kerouac. Mm -hmm. what, what made you want to begin there? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I sort of come to believe so strongly, which is this, that a, a life can't be um, assessed chronologically. You know, uh, it, it's not the case that uh, what happens last is most important. And I find Kerouac's example so sort of moving and wonderful because, well, I suppose this is also something about, um, I mean, the book is also about how as one gets older, one's tastes change. There's sort of, there's lots of sort of grumbling and debunking and uh, that goes on. And there's lots of sort of inveighing against writers that I think are sort of, re you know, re really terrible. But I've had a, I don't know what your relate, you know, I don't know what your relationship with On the Road is, but that's the classic book that you read when you're 19 or 20 and then you outgrow. But my experience of it has been so different. I find it just more and more moving as I as I as I get older. What about you, Sam? What do you think? I have, I you know I have not revisited it since oh. since that teenage read. But uh, the other thing is that I mean it, it kind of groups in in your book with some other books that you talk about. I loved how you you I think you mentioned Dostoevsky and Catcher in the Rye and some other books that you know you have to be sort of of an age where you're ready to be converted. And yeah. uh, and um, I think the line, I can't find the line about Dostoevsky, but it was you know when you, you have to read Dostoevsky at a time when you're really ready to read people like Dostoevsky. I think is how you phrase it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I I liked that a lot. But then I also liked juxtaposed with that this some books that you kind of came to and re you resisted, but sort of and maybe on the road is like that too. But I Rob, the Robert Stone's Flag for Sunrise. Oh, yeah. I'm a big Robert Stone fan, and I was, I was kind of delighted to see you talk about that book a little bit. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so just to go back to Kerouac, so yeah, that book... Meant Sorry, I didn't mean on, to... On, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. On the Road continues to... Uh, I'm continually astonished by how much On the Road continues to, to, to matter to me. But, um, yeah, there's this wonderful photograph of Kerouac that I discuss, and... Um, you know, it's we've all enjoyed watching that footage of Kerouac as a kind of bloated, drunken sort of buffoon on chat shows. And we know he just ended up as a kind of alcoholic and, you know, extraordinary living with his mum and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's we all, we're also all familiar with the long struggle that he had to get on the road published. And I think uh, in as early as 1952, he writes in a letter, you know, on the road will duly be published with a few cuts and will be recognized as a great American novel. And then something like whatever it is, seven, eight years later, that comes true and it's published a great acclaim. And, you know, it took such incredible devotion and kind of heroism on uh, Kerouac's part to, 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 you know, he just, he, he just wagered everything on this being a great book. And he, it, it succeeded, it paid off. And from the moment that On the Road was published, it seems to me he was indemnified against not only um, uh, uh, making a mistake in his life, but ever having made a mistake. Uh, the, the book is a complete sort of redemption of that. But it uh, still, uh, then the price he pays for that is living out the rest of his life, imprisoned by the uh, technique of spontaneous prose, which he, you know, arrived at and, and all, all of this kind of stuff. Um, so that's why, and then I think in the next section, when I talk about, and this became very current recently, uh, likening that to the way that, um, oh, you know, I, uh, I see Boris Becker coming out of a restroom on Wimbledon's center court and he can hardly walk. And of course he's a, become a sort of slightly ludicrous figure, a ludicrous figure who's now actually, since the book has came out, come out, is in jail for bankruptcy. But, you know, uh, that's tough on him. And it's-, it's I find that, I find the Boris Becker thing very painful personally, because- uh, You mean what's happened to him? Well, I've always had this felt this connection to him because we're the same age. And so when he won Wimbledon at 17, I was 17. And I, yeah. you know, I felt at once like, wow, I've done nothing and will do nothing compared to the, what this person has already done. Yet I also felt, you know, he was speaking for all the 17 year olds or something like that. And, and then to see, you know, him, and then he won again. And then that was someone who uh, did his best work early. And um, yeah, and yeah. it's, um, 
you know, and it's, it's, I mean, to bring it back to Nietzsche, when Nietzsche first uh, announces the idea of the eternal recurrence, you know, he says, you know, what if somebody told you, um, you know, that you're going to live your whole life over and over again, now and throughout eternity, all eternity, you know, wouldn't you gnash your teeth and say, oh my God, that's just the most terrible thing I've ever heard. And then, you know, then he says, but have you ever known a moment have you ever had a moment in your life when you'd say you're a god and I've never heard anything more divine? So at the moment, there's Boris Becker in, in jail in, in England. Uh, but, you know... But he's also know. thinking, I got Wimbledon coming to me soon again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, it's, uh, you know, it's, and these are people who've ridden, risen to such heights that we just can't imagine. And, you know, yeah, it's... I, Boris Becker's has been an amazing life to have won Wimbledon three times. Or if you think of somebody who, in a sense, you know, reached an even higher level, Diego Maradona, you know, that, I mean, these are people who, if they, I mean, their, their aftermaths are particularly kind of catastrophic. But yeah, they must have, uh, you know, they, those, those moments are just, well, they're moments that people like you and I can't even imagine. The uh, you know the the uh, what those moments are like you know we're happy if we just get a kind mention in a book in a book review. Well, that's that's our Wimbledon. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we're about to take questions. Is there anything you wanted to say about again the uh, the title character Roger Federer before we uh, go to go to questions? Um, I guess um, the only thing was that uh, you know he'd been. Uh, there was just, he's the opposite of, of Becker in a way, in that, you know, he'd managed to, uh, uh, Becker fell into a, a more, more or less continuous decline. <coughs> and I liked the way that there was this long phase when <coughs> Roger was, looked like he was unable to win a Grand Slam because he'd always come up against either Nadal or Djokovic who would beat him. But, <coughs> He seemed, admittedly, he'd won a lot of a lot of uh, Grand Slams by then. But it seemed that he genuinely liked playing tennis so much, and he liked everything about being on the tour, that he could make a, an accommodation with that. That he liked his life as it was. So you know, why should he stop doing this thing, even if he well, it was no longer number one in in, in the world? Yeah, and it's also hard to imagine him having a catastrophic after tennis life. Yes, it really, it, yes, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Whereas so often uh, with athletes, I think one of the problems is that they've just got sort of no inner life at all. You know, with some, some tennis players are, are big readers, but, uh, you know, it seems to me it's such a great life if you like reading being a tennis player because you're always on, a, on, always on a plane, you know. But, uh, yeah, I think the idea, you know, that Andy Murray documentary resurfacing about his hip surgery, you know, it was just, it was just awful for him not to be, not to be living as an athlete. Yeah. We're going to take some questions uh, now. The first <coughs> one is from Naomi Tarantal. If I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that last name correctly. Can you tell us something about that beautiful painting framing you? <laughs> Do you know, uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the artist, but it's, um, it's, uh, it was a, it's done by a, a graduate student uh, when she just graduated from college, I've forgotten uh, her name. And my wife, who runs a sort of online art gallery, she discovered this this painter, I think, and and bought it. And we've had it for ages now, and we just absolutely love it. Yeah, great. Um, the next question uh, from Nick Stewart is Jeff. You talk about Bob Dylan in the book. I wonder what you make of the recent opening of the Dylan Center in Tulsa and whether you feel our impulse to celebrate and memorialize certain artists in this way in their lifetime suggests that we're no longer treating them as living and working artists. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that, isn't it, with uh, the extent to which uh, a claim becomes a, a, an epitaph. But, uh, well, I think if anyone uh, merits having a you know their uh, a sort of center devoted to them it's Dylan uh, I'd let's put it like this as a way of both dodging and answering your question 
I'd be more inclined to go and spend a couple of days at that center than I would to go and hear Dylan perform wherever it is he, he might be uh, performing. Yeah, actually, I just talked to someone who was at the center. They said it was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I bet, it, I bet it is, yeah. Uh, oh, next question, Jeff, what are the peak experiences of your late middle age? Oh, goodness me. Uh, <clears throat> God, could it really be that there haven't been any? Um, uh, I'd really struggle to think what they are. Um, I hope this is just because my brain is all foggy with COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to pass on that question, I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe this interview is the peak experience of your late middle age. God, that's uh, certainly the peak experience of my day <laughs> since I spent so wretched all day. Uh, here's another question from Mara Jakobowitz. Uh, wishing you a quick recovery. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. What's next? And what young writers should we be on the lookout for? Thoughts of when we cease to understand the world? Have you read that book, When We Cease to Understand the World? Oh, I blurbed it, actually. You did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that book is, is amazing, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I it's agree. one of those, yeah, it's one of those books that I think quite a small independent publisher in Britain asked me for a blurb to sort of help it, help it on its way a little bit. And then it's one of those sat and I thought it was great. And it's one of those things that's snowballed and has just become this, uh, you know, really, um, you know, just it's become a sort of phenomenon, hasn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful book. Um, also, someone told me to read the book, a book by the translator of that book which I have, I haven't read it yet, but it's called My Father's Diet. And uh, it looks very, very yeah. funny and smart. Yeah. Uh, and let's, I'd have to look at my diary to remember uh, other books that I've read recently. So let's have another question while I'm, while I'm waiting. Well, I, I don't even if, know how, sh how young she is, but uh, I really liked uh, Pola Olavarak's book, Mona, that was published uh, quite quite recently but I've reached the age now where everyone seems you know I look at people and I, I, think, I think everyone looks like they're about 30 so I don't know how old Paul is but uh, she well, can yeah I mean we're getting to the point where everyone's a younger writer uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um the uh the Q&A module which I launched quite seamlessly I don't know if you understood that I did that um, <laughs> I'm quite proud of myself uh is empty at the moment okay so um, this would be a, a great, I, there's a passage I would really love to read to finish things off actually, Sam, if that's- That would okay. be wonderful, thank you. Still leave potentially a, a, a little bit of time at the end, but it's this passage. <clears throat> at any poetry reading, however enjoyable, the words we most look forward to hearing are always the same. I'll read two more poems. The words we truly long for are, I'll read one more poem, but two seems to be the conventionally agreed minimum. It's lovely hearing this. You can feel a sigh of relief passing through the audience, especially if the previous couple of poems have been precedent setting sonnets clocking in at under a minute each. After long months in the sea of poetry, the shout has gone up from the crow's nest. Land, we're almost there, we've made it can practically taste the scurvy healing lager being poured in a bar afterwards. But then these two last poems turn out to be the opposite of the sonnets that had served as a double full storm before the concluding multi-part epics. The felt duration of each is twice as long as Robert Browning's 400 page, The Ring and the Book, which raises a question. Why did we come if, while being here, we would end up being so preoccupied by no longer being here? Could it be that our deepest desire is for everything to be over with? We want encores, value for money, bang for our buck. But however vigorously we've been clapping and clamoring for more, there is invariably a sense of relief when it becomes clear that the band, despite our collective imploring, are not coming back that the house lights have flickered on, bringing the last residue of applause to an immediate, slightly impolite halt, 
and that we can apply ourselves single-mindedly to getting a good place in the stampede for the, for the exits. Beneath it all, writes Philip Larkin, desire of oblivion runs. Lovely and so true. The, I, so I was cool. laughing so hard when I first read the bit about, you know, I, I'll read two more poems. Um, but it is, you know, and I have to be honest with myself thinking about being at, you know, even a, a musical, a concert of a band I love that I understand that, that relief, oh, they're not coming back out. I can go now. I'm not yes, and it is, <laughs> it is uh, striking, isn't it? How, uh, it, you know, the mood, once, the, once the house lights flick on, we're, we're out of there. Um, perhaps the only thing that people don't ever want to leave is a webinar. <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, oh, and you and you ended with Larkin, who uh, we learned was a, in the in the eyes of Naipaul, a minor poet, right? Wasn't that yes, it? yeah. Um, but uh, you know, who I find uh, inc incredibly funny. But of course, Larkin was. Uh, you know, Larkin spent the last I don't know. I mean, because of that gen that generation of being English. I mean, really was sort of staring death in the face for a you know very very very. Uh, from the time of sort of 50 onwards, really. Yeah, and there are, I mean, we won't go into it now, but you do talk about some contemporary writers who I know you admire. Well, I mean, I'll mention them like Amos and DeLillo, who, whose later works you're, you sort of have some questions about. Yeah, I guess that raises a sort of more general uh, point, really, that, you know, I was, uh, this, we were talking earlier about writers who, who publish uh, just just one book, and then there's obviously uh, writers who have very very long long careers, but then you wonder, and typically the you know you do your best stuff not at the end, and you I sort of wonder if the ability to keep going depends in some ways on being uh, oblivious to what for your readers is very obvious, um, you know, I that there's a there's a decline there. And, you know, and then I talk about uh, that phrase I've used before with DeLillo De talking about this tendency that all writers can have towards um, self, self karaoke. And, yeah. And then we've got other examples, somebody like Joyce Carol Oates, for example, who really does seem indef indefatigable, you know, just this uh, sort of extraordinary kind of cr creative uh, long longevity. But then all the time I'm saying this about uh, people, I'm also, very conscious that it's possible that uh, I am myself exhibiting ex exactly the symptoms that I'm that I'm diagnosing in right. other others that I might be suffering from a, a pathology that I'm uh, that I'm that I'm diagnosing. But well, as they, yeah, as someone said, the, the same darkness envelops us all, right? But um, yeah. I think that uh, it does link up to something that I really it was a funny riff in the in the book about. The movies, you know, the trope in, in every caper and crime movie about one last job. Yeah. You do one last, one more and I'm out, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's almost as though they are going to do that job for the precise reason that it's going to go wrong. Yeah. And uh, that, it, you know, we'll all go to shit and, and, and uh, end horribly. But they have, you know, so it's really, they don't, if they don't even really believe that they're going to do one last job and get out. It's, they know full well what they're doing and maybe we just need to keep writing till we write that book that is that one last job book that <laughs> yeah, yeah you know yeah yes and it's um but yeah and it's uh yeah it's such there must be yeah, there must that must be going on it can't just be a convention can it i think yeah. it uh, in films it, it sort of addresses a a, a deeper need like that but the then, way the way you ended that which i loved was which was that you know you would like to see a movie where the guy doesn't go on the job and <laughs> yeah. stays home. And in fact, maybe never becomes a criminal at all and just grows up and, and leads an ordinary life. Um, yeah. And maybe why can't we watch that film? Yeah. <laughs> it's a, but then on the other hand, it is nice when these kind of, you know, when there is a last chance. So in the book, I talk about, you know, for example, um, uh, Gene Reese, you know, had this thing of, you know, publishes four books, they're kind of flops in the 1930s, missing, presumed dead. And then I think 30 years after the book number four uh, came out, she publishes uh, Wide Sargasso Sea. 
and has this, you know, the acclaim that is, it's the, you know, gets this great acclaim for it, but it, it's too late for her. And by then, I mean, she's just such a sort of her life is just so much wreckage in her life. But I think that's quite an interesting thing that, um, okay, so it's great that she gets the acclaim that she does uh, for that book. But then actually it turns out that's just the beginning for a much larger kind of critical re-evaluation of, uh, of what was going on in the 1930s when, when those first four books uh, came out. So sometimes that one last job, that one last book can, um, you know, can have um, uh, positive uh, effects like that. Well, this book had a lot of positive effects on me and I'm sure that it will have a lot of positive effects on everyone who reads it. It's, uh, it's right. wonderful. It's, as I said to you in an email, it's peak dire, <laughs> yeah. fill at your peak. So reading it was one of my peak middle age experiences. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. And we'll hand back to Kay now. Yes. Oh, thank you both so much. This was lovely. And uh, as a bookseller to hand sell a book in which someone says, can you tell me a little bit about this? <laughs> I say, figure it out on your own. <laughs> I'm not going to signpost it for you. Page 245, <laughs> the whole uh, thing is explained. <laughs> <laughs> This was great. Uh, really sad that we didn't get to see you in person tonight. It would have been lovely too. Yes. Uh, well, you both made me feel so much better. Oh, actually. Yeah. Well, happy healing to you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad we got to see you here. Me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Feel so better, much. Jeff. Feel better. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a good night. Bye. Buy the book. Goodbye and buy the book. Bye-bye. <laughs>